Empire. We're at the midway point of the NFL season, and what have we learned? What's up, everybody? It's Mike Jones. Thanks for coming back for another episode of the Football Jones Podcast. You can read me at usatoday.com. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ByMikeJones. Week 9 is in the books. We're officially halfway through, or just a titch. It was like midway on Sunday. The NFL reached the halfway point of its games, and then a couple more were played. So I think we're technically 52% through the NFL's 2020 season. And I wrote about my big surprises, big disappointments, things like that. You can go check that out on usatoday.com. But I really wanted to take a deep dive into this. And there's nobody better at pulling back the layers than Peter King. And so Peter King is my guest today. Very honored to have him. One of my idols coming up when I was a kid, deciding I wanted to be a sports writer. As you know, his column in Sports Illustrated was a must read. Now he is with NBC Sports. His work is still a must read. So Peter just has this amazing mind. He's got amazing connections, amazing insight. And he is going to break it all down for us right now. We're talking about what we've learned about the first half of the season, what stood out to him, what some of the questions going forward are for the remainder of this season. It's a real treat. Let's get going right here. Okay, and here we are, as promised. Very honored to have the GOAT, Peter King, Football Morning in America, columnist for NBC Sports. You know who he is. Uh, Just very happy that we can glean from his knowledge for a few minutes here on the first half of the season. Peter, how are you? I'm great, Mike. Thanks a lot for asking me. Hey, thanks for joining us. Um, I kind of wanted to um, get your thoughts on this has been a weird year, Um, a year like we have not seen off the field and compelling on the field as well. So I kind of wondered, what is your impression of this season been? Um, And what, you know, we want to talk about kind of what some of the storylines that really have intrigued you are. But just briefly, kind of an overview, what have you made of this season so far? Well, I'm pretty surprised that we're 52% of the way through the regular season and there are no games that are still hanging in the balance. Every game continues to be scheduled uh, and uh, there are eight weeks left in the season, uh, in the regular season, and everything is on course. However, with a capital H, uh, I think it would be unrealistic to expect that the last eight weeks of this season will be played as normal. Um, As we look and see every day that there's 100,000 more cases of COVID in the United States and look and see that, for instance, last Friday, Mike, in a memo sent out around the NFL, which is, it happens every day, there were 15 documented positive tests on Friday alone. That's not just players, that's also you know, the tier one people around the league, the coaches, the equipment staff, the people who touch the players every day. And we're just getting into the heavy part of the pandemic. Um, If if I could just say one other thing that I think sort of intrigues me about this season, it's that here we are on, uh, you know, approaching the middle of November. Does anybody really know and really feel good about who the best team is? Right. I mean, we've just seen the Pittsburgh Steelers off to the greatest start in their history, struggle mightily to beat a very flawed Dallas team. Um, we've seen the, the Kansas City Chiefs who, I mean, Patrick Mahomes is, is getting to be Michael Jordan. He just is. But, I mean, they almost lost to the Carolina Panthers. You know, and I just, it's, so I just don't think, and then you see the Bucks and everybody like the Bucks, but you see them and, and they just get their clocks absolutely clean, um, you know, at home by the Saints. So I just, I think 
one of the things that makes for good ratings, makes for good TV, makes for fan suspense is not knowing the outcome of what's going to happen. And I don't know anybody right now who can tell you with any confidence that they know what's going to happen in the next eight weeks. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, it's been uh, pretty fascinating. And then, you know, like you said, you, this, this Pittsburgh Steelers team, they've got that perfect record, but they definitely are a flawed squad. Um, but the one thing that impresses me is that they always seem to find a way. And I guess that's a credit to Mike Tomlin, uh, to the leadership, uh, to the experience that Big Ben has, um, and just the, the talent they have, the young talent, uh, the versatility they have on defense. But, yeah, I, I, I don't look at them and think, man, that is a great team, even yeah. though they've got a great record right here. Look, I think, you know, Mike Tomlin is a terminally underrated coach. And, you know, I remember a couple of years ago talking to Bill Parcells about all the young phenoms who were being hired. You know, Sean McVay and then Zach Taylor, Matt LaFleur, you know, a year and a half ago or whatever. I mean, and McVay obviously has been longer than that. But I remember one of the things he said to me that day is he said, you know, it's fine to hire really brilliant minds and people who can game plan up a storm and all that. But he said a head coach's job is not – his biggest job is not – you know, calling plays and going down and get your fingers dirty, hands dirty in, in play calling, things like that. It's running your franchise, being the weather vane for the franchise and being the, being the guy who runs everything in your shop. And I mean, obviously when Al Davis was alive, that wasn't the case with the Raiders, but for the vast majority of NFL teams, the head coach is the CEO uh, and the COO at the same time. And so I think Mike Tomlin, what makes him so good is that, you know, and we'll use uh, Le'Veon Bell and, uh, and, and Antonio Brown as, as examples. You know, when he lost those two guys, basically in back-to-back -back years, you say, well, boy, I'll tell you what, they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? They just, they move on. There's a stealer way we're going to win who is at whoever is in those uniforms because we're going to find a way to win. And, uh, and look, I agree with you, Mike. It's just, I think they're a flawed team, but then they've beaten consecutively on the road, mm -hmm. uh, Tennessee, Baltimore, and obviously a, a much flawed Dallas team, but a Dallas team that I think would have beaten a lot of teams on Sunday. And, and look, the, the object of the game did you get the win or did you not? And right. Pittsburgh's getting it. Yeah. Um, when you talk about the, the Chiefs, obviously they lost to the Raiders. They had a close call um, yesterday with the Panthers. I sometimes get the sense that they're almost kind of tinkering and experimenting um, each week saying, hey, can we win this way? Can we do it this way here? Uh, and that we're not seeing them really open it all up yet. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, I continue to wonder – because I think, uh, I forget how many, I think uh, Le'Veon Bell had like four yards on Sunday when they scored 33 points. So you just say, well, either he has no role in this offense and they're not really interested in him having a big role because they like Clyde Edwards Hilaire more. He's just an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. Or exactly as you say, they're tinkering with things. And Andy Reid, Eric Bieniemy. uh, and Frank Kafka, the quarterback coach, are, are sitting in Andy Reid's office. I guarantee you, they are sitting in his office and will be, even though they have to buy this week. They're going to be sitting in there saying, how can we use Le'Veon Bell to win games? Mm -hmm. and, and so, I, you know, I don't think this ends up like a Shady McCoy deal, Mike, where – Shady McCoy just goes there and all of a sudden he kind of falls off the face of the earth. I think they're going to find a way at some point down the stretch of this season because they've got sort of a strange schedule. You know, they come back from their bye. They're at Vegas, at Tampa, and then back to back in December at Miami, at New Orleans. So this is not going to be a mail it in mm -hmm. back half of the season for, for Kansas City. They got some tough games. 
who are some of the teams or, or figures who have surprised you the most this year for the good? Um, and we'll talk about the disappointments in a little bit, but, but when you look at all the teams, the players, the way things have played out so far, who, who's been a surprise for you? Well, the first one will probably surprise you because he's on a losing team, and that's Joe Judge. I think one of the things he has done is he's gone in and taken a sunken franchise by the throat. And he said, this is the way we're going to do it. If you're not on the boat, uh, we'll leave you at the port. And, but we are doing it this way. He did it with Golden Tate, a guy who definitely could have made some plays to help them win on Sunday in Washington. Turns out they didn't need him, but they left him home because of a discipline issue. Um, I, would, I would point to three other sort of positives that I see. I mean, number, number two would be Dalvin Cook. And, you know, to me, I think one of the things that Mike Zimmer demands of his offense is we're not turning the ball over, period. Right. And if we turn it over, we're going to make major changes. And you've seen in the last two weeks when Kirk Cousins has thrown 14 and 19 passes respectively, uh, respectively in the last two weeks, uh, you've seen now that they have gone totally in Dalvin Cook's corner with an assist to Alexander Madison, who I think is the best backup running back in football. But so I think the Vikings now, even though they're three and five, they're not out of it. Right. They are not. They, I'm not saying they're going to win their division, but I think that they still have a beating heart of a wild card chance. Um, the third thing I would point to is Baltimore. I think – one of the things you see when they go to Indianapolis, which is their most dangerous road game other than Pittsburgh, left on their schedule, they go to Indianapolis and they hold them to 10 points. Um, they, they score seven points on defense. Um, really did not let Indianapolis breathe. They're showing you that, look, we do not have to rely on Lamar Jackson to win our games. Our defense can win games too. And then finally, I think I would say that the Miami Dolphins, my, Miami will make the playoffs, Mike. I don't know whether they're going to win their division, doubtful, but they will make the playoffs, um, you know, after winning their last four. I'd say those are, the, those are the, the, the four or five things in the NFL that I think have surprised me for the positive. Gotcha. For, for, um, for Baltimore, with that defense – you know, like you said, they, they're not as reliant on Lamar. But what do you think has to happen so that way when they play a team where they're behind um, that they can, can still be effective? Because we've seen when they fall behind, it's a struggle for them um, offensively. Uh, but bolstering that defense, I think, does help them a bit. What, what, do, you, what do you see? What yeah, you I, you know, I really think if you look back to the end of the Pittsburgh game and you saw when – um, the, Baltimore's in the red zone. It's fourth down, and Lamar is stretching, stretching, stretching to try to get the first down. Mm -hmm. And then he fumbles, and he loses the fumble. It doesn't matter because he wouldn't have made it. It was fourth down, right. uh, and he didn't make the first down. But that's a great example of Lamar Jackson needing the light bulb to go off a little bit in his head now. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, uh, just like we talked about with Minnesota and Kirk Cousins. You simply absolutely 100% cannot turn it over three or four times in a game. Right. And Lamar Jackson, you know, unfortunately, um, that has been a bit of an issue for him in the two big losses that they've had this year. And so I kind of look at him as he's still a work in progress. I thought he played a very good second half at Indianapolis. Yeah. I'm not absolutely down on him. I'm a little concerned about him. Right. Uh, because of his play in some of the big games. But, you know, I also think back to last year when in the big games against New England, Seattle, San Francisco, he was great. Mm -hmm. So I think that these are little snapshots in time that he's, he's got plenty of time to get over. And I, I wouldn't feel panicky at all about Lamar Jackson. What about Miami um, uh, appeals to you? I, I love the way Brian Flores has really – Change the mindset of this team. Their defense, I think it's 14 straight games now that they forced a turnover. Um, they're leading scoring defense. But just the, the courage it took for him to make that move to go to Tua, 
you know, that was kind of risky, a little bit of a roll of a dice, but I, I feel like he's just got a great feel for, for how he wants that team to look and how he wants to lead. You know, well, the interesting thing is, I think the one part of that decision that really did not get much attention. And again, it's not, um, it's not overwhelming, but I do think that one of the things that Brian Flores thought when he looked at his team is that, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick in a season and a half um, had turned it over 22 times. He turned, he threw 20 interceptions you know, in his, in his time as quarterback, whatever it was, uh, you know, 22 games or what, whatever is since the start of last season was. Uh, and that he didn't play them all because obviously Josh Rosen played some. Right. But the one thing I think about Tua, even though we have a very small sample size, I think Brian Flores thought that Tua was going to take care of the ball better. And again, it's only been two games, but he has has not thrown a pick yet. But the thing that really impresses me about Miami as we sit here right now is that I think that they are a rising defense. And you may not have been able to tell it by, you know, the play yesterday um, in Miami or in uh, Arizona. But I do think that if you look at it as a whole, you know, this is a team that uh, has allowed 14 points a game over the last four games. Um, they've had three decisive victories in their last four games, all wins. And I think they are rising at the right time with a young defense. Nobody knows half these guys. Emmanuel Ogba has been reborn um, after not getting a long enough uh, leash in, uh, in Cleveland uh, and just having a cup of coffee, really, in Kansas City. But he's got a chance now to be one of the best edge players in football. And so I, I just think now you look at their team, and I just sort of trust Brian Flores, and I kind of trust what they do. What do you think it is about him? We've seen a lot of uh, Bill Belichick assistants go elsewhere and not have the success. What is it that makes Flores um, possibly the exception to that, that trend? I think a couple of things. One, you know, and again, I do not know Brian Flores well at all, but it always helps when you get to go to a team where you and the general manager and the personnel side of the building are absolutely on the same page. And he's on the same page with Chris Greer. Right. Um, and I think that really helps. But I think the other thing that, that has helped him a lot is that he has not tried in any way um, to be Belichick. And I think sometimes when you come from that tree uh, and you've done, you, the only person who's basically trained you in football is Bill Belichick. Brian Flores, the people who know him well say he has not changed one bit, even in front of the team. He's the same guy who was in front of the team in New England and has not tried to be uh, Bill Belichick. I think in some ways uh, that has hurt other coaches who've left Belichick. I'll say one other thing about Flores. Although he is the great beneficiary of draft pick largesse mm -hmm. that Chris Greer has pulled off, you know, I'll also say that Brian Flores would not have wanted to trade Laramie Tunsil. Yeah. I doubt he would have wanted to trade Kenny Stills. I doubt even though he wasn't getting along at the end, or the organization wasn't with Minka Fitzpatrick. I mean, he didn't, he wants a Minka Fitzpatrick on his team, right. you know, but he viewed that for the long haul, that what they can get draft choice currency wise was going to be better than having those guys. And I think so far he's been proven right. I mean, he's, they're 10 and seven, I think in the last calendar year. And I, I think they're, absolutely on the right track especially now that you know two has got to play a while more but right. now that they seem to have their quarterback of the future what have been some things that have really been disappointing to you um i mean i know there's a number of things you know that probably stand out but what are a couple of things that you really thought was going to do a little differently than what it has been I, you know last night when i was I, I put x marks on on six 
little teams, and I'll give you a sentence or two on each one. I did not think that the New York Jets were going to fall to earth with as big a thud as they did. And I've got nothing against Adam Gase, but they've got to make a change at coach. Absolutely, unequivocally have to make a change at coach. Um, I think that what happened in Houston with Bill O'Brien getting fired after only four games absolutely had to happen. I just hope that Deshaun Watson can get a head coach who he absolutely trusts and who knows that for the next probably year and a half, you're going to be way behind the eight ball because you're not going to have a lot of draft choices. But I still think Houston's going to be an attractive job, Mike, because they have the one thing that is the hardest thing to find in football, and that's a franchise quarterback. I think the inconsistency of Denver worries me. Their defense has been very, very up and down, as has Drew Locke. I expected them to be better. The Cowboys, obviously, but it bothers me. Their their effort bothered me until yesterday. Right. Like, I think Ezekiel Elliott has been borderline awful for most of the time this year. Clearly helped them lose with, with his fumbling against Arizona. Uh, did not play well at all against Washington in another embarrassing loss. So Mike McCarthy has got to do a good job in the second half of this season. They're not going to save their season. Right. But he's got to do a better job of establishing himself as the long-term leader of this team. The failure of the Bears to get the quarterback to play well or get the quarterback to even play at a C-plus level is, quite frankly, infuriating. You've got a guy who was probably the chief Andy Reid disciple, you know, in Matt Nagy, and it's just, it's just plain weird how quarterbacks have performed so terribly in Chicago. And then I think finally what I would say is, San Francisco is a negative almost through no fault of their own. Right. It's been a long time since I've seen a team as beat up and as sort of besmirched by COVID as the 49ers have been. And look, all I can say is if you do not have what I consider to be your four best players or four most important players, uh, and that, and that is, uh, you know, Richard Sherman on defense who, you know, obviously has been, you know, has been a great player for so long. And, and to me, also sort of almost the spiritual leader of that team. Um, if you don't have him and, you know, you don't have Bosa rushing the passer, there's your two biggest guys on defense. Mm-hmm. And then you don't have Garoppolo and Kittle on offense. Just, you know, how would you expect to be competitive in the best division in football? So, I don't blame the 49ers, but that's been a very, very weird year for them. Yeah, it's unfortunate. You know, that Super Bowl team, that the runner-up, that, you know, the Super Bowl hangover, you know, legend is actually, it's unfortunate. Because I really thought that maybe they would have a chance to defy that um, and continue to compete. But then when everything kind of has fallen apart from just week one on, I was like, man, they just can't catch a break. What do you think it is about Ezekiel Elliott um, that, why is he playing so poorly? Is it just the fact that, the, the system, Mike McCarthy doesn't really have a track record of strong running back, you know, friendly um, offense. What, what do you think it is? Um, well, when I look at, you know, I watched a lot of their loss to Washington, mm-hmm. okay? And I, you know, there was one play in that game that if I were Mike McCarthy, it would have absolutely infuriated me. And that is the play. You may remember it, Mike when uh, the, when basically Elliot was assigned a uh, blitz pickup. Mm-hmm. Okay. And a young linebacker named Cole Holcomb came through the, the right guard tackle hole and he was bearing down on Andy Dalton. And this was the game, obviously Dalton uh, got the concussion, but he's bearing down on Andy Dalton and he steamrolled. Ezekiel Elliott, like he was, like he weighed 120 pounds and he sacked Andy Dalton. It was, I I mean, honestly, if I were Ezekiel Elliott, I would have been not just kind of, oh man, I screwed that. I'd I'd have been embarrassed. (laughs) 
You know, I'd have been totally embarrassed. And that comes on the heels six days after he fumbles twice in the first half against Arizona. He has to be the, the great offensive force to prevent this team from spinning out of control. And in the first half of the season, he just wasn't. What, um, what has been the craziest season that you've covered? How many years have you been covering the league now? 36. 36. What's been the craziest year that you've covered? There's no question it was 1987. Okay. Because in 1987, the NFL played uh, two regular season games to start the season. And then the players went on strike. Mm -hmm. And they were locked out by teams. So for the next three weeks, NFL teams invented squads of replacement players through many semi-pro players. I mean, the, the, the uh, Buffalo Bills left tackle when Lawrence Taylor crossed the picket line in week five that year was a truck driver from Southern Illinois. Um, and it was just, it was the weirdest time you've ever seen. Teams that invested a lot of time and energy scouting the, the Bush leagues of minor league football ended up playing well and winning and that was the year Washington won the Super Bowl, in part because far and away, Washington and San Francisco had the two best strike teams in football. But the two other interesting things about that season were Mike Ditka was the coach of the Bears. And one of his quarterbacks on the 1987 Chicago Bears was a young kid who would played professional football in England <laughs> from Eastern Illinois named Sean Payton. Wow. And, and, and so, I mean, those were the kind of stories. Yeah. And at the time I was covering the New York giants. And I remember one day Parcells who was, who thought that this was the most Bush league thing on the planet, having to coach these guys who there was a semi pro team in Connecticut called the West Haven giants. Uh -huh. And so the giants just saw one of their games and signed about 10 of their guys for their team. But Parcells once told me that his, you know, his wife, uh, during that first week when they had to prepare this strike team, Parcel slept through the alarm. <laughs> and his wife woke up and started crying and said, you're not going, are you? You're, you're, not, you're not going today. And he goes, I'm going. And so he got up and barely went to the office to prepare to play with a bunch of, you know, guys. But, yeah. uh, you know... As strange as this is, wondering whether every week the games are going to get played because of a pandemic, right. that was pretty strange. Yeah. At least you recognize <laughs> these players and coaches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, Mike, can I tell you one other quick thing oh, that sure. you'll love? Yes. You'll love this. So my first year covering the NFL was 1984. I covered the Bengals in Cincinnati for the Cincinnati Inquirer. And I moved to New York in 85. But in 1984... I, that was Boomer Esiason's rookie year. So I got to know him pretty well that year, and I kept in touch with him and, and all that. So in 1987, the biggest bone of contention in the entire league uh, at that, that year was Boomer Esiason and the, uh, the very, very militant uh, union people in Cincinnati uh, against the strike team of the Bengals. And one day, the strike team came in every day on a bus from wherever they were staying in a hotel. And Boomer Esiason, who a year later would be the MVP of the NFL, laid down in the middle of the street. What? So the bus, so the bus could not get into the Bengals' facility. So, I mean, Mike, we talk about, well, will the game be played this weekend? That just simply does not compare to 1987. No. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Wow. Just the mental <laughs> images seeing Boomer Esiason laying on the ground in front of a bus. <laughs> <laughs> Boomer Esiason being Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we don't know how this year is going to wind up. We don't know if it's going to be 18 weeks. Um, you know, they have to tack on. We don't know if it's just going to end and then they have an expanded playoffs. Um, we don't know if the Super Bowl is going to happen right on time. But if you had to predict um, football-wise how this ends, your, your teams that are still left standing, what do you think and how do these picks compare to the way you open the season? Well, at the start of the season, I picked Tampa Bay and Baltimore. And 
it wouldn't shock me if either team uh, made the Super Bowl. Uh, and I'm not one to throw Tampa Bay out with the garbage because they just got totally embarrassed this week. Mm -hmm. It's only been three weeks since they totally embarrassed uh, the Green Bay Packers. So, I, you know, things change a lot in football. But I think if I had to pick right now, uh, and it's tough to pick somebody in the NFC, but I, if I had to pick right now, I'd pick a Kansas City-Seattle Super Bowl. The reason I would pick Seattle is that even though I'm depressed about their defense, um, I think that when you get a, a Jamal Adams, and I think they're going to be getting uh, Snacks Harrison, uh, you know, for, for the middle of their defensive line to really help them stop the run better. When you have both of those guys playing, relatively speaking, uh, at a high level, you know, who knows health-wise how Jamal Adams really is. Mm -hmm. But my feeling is if you get both of those guys um, playing and contributing in that defense, I think they're going to be good enough to win, in my opinion, what is a flawed NFC. I really like the Saints, obviously, but I just wonder uh, defensively whether they're going to be able to hold up um, and continue the way they played. Uh, at Tampa. You still love what you do? I really love what I do. I'm surprised that I love it, even though I'm, I'm probably not going to leave my Brooklyn apartment much, if at all, this season. That, yeah. that kind of bums me out because, you know, Mike, we, one of the things that is a big disadvantage in doing the thing, we, thing that you and I do is that it's difficult to not be able to go into a locker room and have a sidebar conversation with a guy maybe you've known for a long time. Yeah. Because the NFL basically is allowing mostly Zoom calls, but you know, I still get to talk to people alone on the phone, which helps. But I just, I just think it's different. Yeah. Um, I think back to the Super Bowl, when at the end of the Super Bowl, maybe 75 minutes after the game, I'm sitting in Andy Reid's office at Hard Rock Stadium with the door closed, just me and him, and he's drawing up the play that changed the course of that Super Bowl. Um, and I used it in my column on Monday. You know, and, and again, I'm not saying, boy, how great am, am I? What I make that point to basically say, those are the kind of things in large part that we're gonna be missing mm -hmm. as the games get much, much bigger and the stakes get higher as this season goes on. That's the part that is the saddest for me we'll all get, we'll all live we'll all be be okay but I do think there's something really missing uh in the coverage of the league this year that um you know is sort of sad both not only for us obviously but for the fans too because I think they're getting less insight on what's really going on out there yeah one last question for you. You have always been someone who is able to pull back that curtain and take people inside. Um, when was it in your career that you figured out, hey, this is how I'm going to do it, and this is the way I'm going to go about just really carving out my, my place in this industry? You know, I think the biggest where that really was impactful to me, and I'm really going to age myself, it was 25 years ago this season. In 1995, I went in the off season that year looking for a team that would allow me access to one week inside their team for the season. I could see everything. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't where the coach couldn't say to me, uh, "You can't go there." The coach just had to trust me that I was going to tell the story of what I saw. And I talked to maybe 10 or 12 teams. And finally, Mike Holmgren of the Packers said, I, I'll let you do it. Now, remember, Mike, that was before Favre was uh, a celebrity of the highest magnitude. And that was the year he won his first MVP. So it was just, it was in October of that season. And it was just an odd way to walk into a team and to be around Brett Favre in his house when he's 
waking up or, 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 you know, putting his feet on the floor and just being in, in pain mm -hmm. and, and just, but, but anyway, what that really convinced me that year, you know, doing that, um, I got a lot of notice for doing that. And what convinced me is that, Hey, you know, I'm not saying nobody else is doing that, but people don't do this. And I'm going to try if I can, to kind of make it my thing. <clears throat> so <clears throat> over the years, when I started the MMQB at Sports Illustrated in 2013, I worked diligently. I worked probably for three months total to convince a team to allow me to show their uh, uh, training camp opening team meeting on our site. And Jerry Jones allowed it. Jason Garrett allowed it. He was had some regrets about it, but he allowed it. And 35 minutes, we have all, you can go find it. You can watch the Dallas Cowboys training camp opening team meeting in 2013, if you care. Um, you know, you'd find that just by Googling it. Right. The, the, other, the other point I guess I would make is it isn't just saying, hey, look what great access we can get. It's, it's honestly, Mike, to say, I really want to take you somewhere where you haven't gone, where you can't go. Like, I did a story on a week in the life of, of an officiating crew in 2013. That was probably the most fun of any story I've done in my life. Not because Gene Sterator was a, a wonderful guy or anything, but I was behind a curtain that nobody's ever, I don't think, I, I might be wrong, but I, I don't know that anybody has ever taken a week. And I spent one day with the back judge in Grand Rapids, Michigan, you know, and, and with, I spent, a day with five different officials on the crew, just seeing what their life is like. Mm -hmm. But I really want to be able to tell people things that they don't know and what they've never seen before. And that's, that's really what kind of makes me the happiest about if I can do my job and, and I'm able to do that. And you do it better than anybody else. I mean, you, you're just an inspiration for everybody's trying to, you know, learn. I, every time I, I always read, and learn from you and have for years um and just like man just you just blow me away with your insight and your knowledge because i will watch the same game and talk to people and i'm like dad gone i i didn't notice that you know and you're <laughs> so i appreciate you uh, oh, thank you mike and i appreciate, I appreciate you it. uh giving us some time here for the podcast because it's a real treat uh to uh my listeners so uh, hey thank you mike you you, you have a great week and and uh, you're doing a great job at USA Today. I really enjoy reading, reading you. I am behind the paywall. So I'm being a good, loyal uh, reader slash investor. So thanks for your insight as well. I appreciate that. And, you know, it's, it's been sad not to see you on the road and everything, but good to see your face here. And hopefully one day we'll be back to normal and uh, we'll see you down the road. Thanks very much, Mike. Have a great week. All right. Thanks. You too. All right, a big thank you to Peter King. If you are not following him on Twitter, not checking out his work every single Monday morning when his column comes out, really breaking down all the action on Sunday, you are missing out and you need to make sure you go make that a regular habit if you are a football fan of any team because he takes a wide look spanning the globe, the football globe. Anyway, I hope you guys have a great day. Thanks for listening. Again, you can read me at usatoday.com. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, at by Mike Jones. And I will talk to you guys again next time.